Reformed Presbyterian Church. Are there any announcements? Happy spring. Happy spring. Until tonight and tomorrow. Might get a little colder. Okay. <clears throat> Women's Monday afternoon Bible study will happen this week. Carolyn is back. <laughs> okay. Please stand if you are able for our opening hymn, number 166. <clears throat> Please remain standing and join me in the Te Deum. We praise you, O God. We acknowledge you to be the Lord. All creation worships you, the Father everlasting. To you all angels cry aloud, the heavens and all the powers therein. To you cherubim and seraphim continually do cry, Holy, 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 Lord God of Sabbath, Heaven and earth are full of your majesty, of your glory. Please be seated. Now we'll have our opening invocation. Our gracious and holy Father, we come to you as we do each Lord's Day in the rhythm of worship, where our soul desires to come encounter with the living and true God. You have stooped to your creation, Lord, and you come to us through the means of everyday life. We think of the bread and the Lord's Supper and the wine. We think of the baptism of water which cleanses. And it's to this bride of yours, the collective church, in which we are individually a participant and member in. And Lord, in this day, I pray that you will give us a glimpse into the theme of your word, how you revealed yourself in the old covenant with the old mediator Moses, and now how you reveal yourself in the new covenant with the new mediator, Jesus the Christ. 
And Lord, help us to worship him and you. Help us to understand that there was a right moment in the planning of your will in which Christ would come. And he has come. And now the new kingdom is here and we are participants. And you are drawing us forward to its conclusion. Indeed, in baptism, Lord, you gave us the conclusion already, for you placed us in your Son and on his work, in his work on the cross. And in that sense, Lord, the future is closed. Just as the past changed history, so our future is forever settled. And Lord, we wish to touch that reality this morning. We hope and pray that faith will grasp and cling and reimagine who we are in Christ. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> the confession and declaration, our confession of sin. Let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. We have died. Christ has risen. We have risen. Let us therefore confess our sins as we worship our risen Lord. Heavenly Father, your Son's work of redemption is finished. While our flesh with its desires has been crucified with Christ, making us truly justified, we are yet encumbered with the residue of sin. We desire, yet we push back. We hope, yet there is grief and sadness. We possess yet not fully. It is this waiting, this not yet, that in part causes our hearts to be heavy. In ways that we cannot fully understand, we sin because we are yet sinners. Forgive us, O Lord, and renew us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Please take a time of silence for personal reflection and confession. Now for his declaration of grace. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we have confessed together we are not what we should be. We are sinners. His law justly weighs in, making our conscience feel its transgression. Nevertheless, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ reign supreme. For the joy of gathering his people and in our place, Christ has both fulfilled the law and has borne the fury of a just and holy wrath. Our guilt is gone. He has also bound the strong man, freeing us from his bondage. Therefore, with joyous shouts of hallelujah, I declare to you God's work through Christ alone, the forgiveness of sins. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son. would please join me in the call to praise from Psalm 63. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I look upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed, and meditate on you from the watches of the night. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you, your right hand upholds me. 
but those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be abortion for But the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exult, for the mouths of liars will be stopped. Please see the screen for the psalm hymn response.
Now we'll have our scripture reading. <clears throat> Whoever does not know the scriptures does not know the power of God, nor his wisdom. Ignoring the scriptures means ignoring Christ. First reading is from Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1 through 13. Hear the word of the Lord. Come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which is not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live, and I will make you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and a commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you, because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found, Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and snow come down from heaven, and do not return, there but water to the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, and it shall accomplish that which I pr propose, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth in singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up from the cypress, instead of the briars shall come up from the myrtle, and it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God's word from 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 13. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank from the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters. As, they, as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality, as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction, on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Thanks be to God.
The Gospel reading comes to us from Luke's Gospel, chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. Hear the word of the Lord. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with the sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he told this parable, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I have found none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put out manure. Then if it should bear no fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. The word of the Lord. And now let's stand and rise as you're able, sing number 176, God Moves in Mysterious Ways. Mysterious way his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. You fearful saints, such courage take the clouds you must so dread. Are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Find unbelief is sure to err, and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. Please be seated. I'm going to read you a paragraph of a writer, uh, Ian Duguid, I think is his name, uh, or Duguid, I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, and this is a commentary on numbers, and we're going to be taking a look at Israel's grumbling. And I thought he just posed it so well that I just want you to hear his words. Grumbling never gets much attention as a problem. Grumbling is not one of the traditional seven deadly sins. In fact, it probably wouldn't make it onto the list if the list were expanded to include the 50 most deadly sins. 
Nobody ever goes around to see a counselor and says, help me, I'm addicted to grumbling. There are no meetings of Grumblers Anonymous or 12-step programs designed to cure the condition. This is certainly not because of a lack of people who suffer from the problem. Which of us has never grumbled about something in his life? We grumble about our politicians, our car mechanics, our jobs, our homes, our spouses, and our children. Perhaps we assume that since we all do it so often, grumbling can't really be so bad. It is virtually our national pastime, so ingrained that it has been described as a God-given right. Only rarely is grumbling recognized in its true seriousness. And I was interested on grumbling a God-given right. I mean, I'm familiar with the Declaration of Independence about our inalienable rights, but I never read anything in there about grumbling. So I, 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 I looked at it. And it says this, according to military historian Elliot Cohen, quote, American troops have a God-given right and tradition of grumbling, end quote. That was written in the Washington Post, October 6, 2003. So that's what he was referring to. Apparently, we have the entitlement of grumbling, and uh, it's a God-given right. So I thought he really captured this well. It is a sin that none of us really recognize. We wouldn't even, it wouldn't even make the top 50, and I think he's right about that. It's not certainly the traditional seven. But what is grumbling and why is it so serious? And again, he says this about grumbling. Um, uh, yes, what does he say? Uh, well, I'll have to draw on my memory here. Uh, I had a little acronym going so I could remember it. Let's see. REI is where I shop for a lot of outdoor clothing. And R and I are correct. We changed the middle one. Okay, so uh, it reinterprets the past. That's what grumbling does. And in the case of Israel, we're going to see, oh, oh, the days of Egypt. Oh, how I long for the days of Egypt. Now, if you know their history, you go, I don't think so. Uh, so that's what it does. Grumbling reinvents the past. I see it in marriages. You know, there's this phrase that just sickens me because it's so flippantly passed around. Ah, oh, you know what my stupid ex did? And I just say to myself, who's really stupid here? You're the one who married him. Or it can be reversed. Oh, you know what my stupid ex did? He did such and such and such. So, uh, or she did such and such. So we reinterpret our falling in love and we turn them into a demon. I see it just from coast to coast, around kitchen tables, around work tables. Uh, this X thing. So that's what grumbling does. It reinterprets the past in a way that's favorable to oneself to continue to sin. You see, if your X is so, so, so bad, then everything you say and rumor about that person is fully justified. The last one is that it um, ignores the future promises of God. That's what grumbling does. Because you look into the future and the middle one is D, I forgot it, now I remember, RDI. So it reinterprets the past, it despises the present. You see, and we see this here in Israel's life. 
Uh, we're going to take a look at it shortly. Oh, this manna. I'm so tired of this manna. You know, when Lewis and Clark finally got to the other side and on the west coast and they spent the winter, uh, they built a log cabin and they spent the winter, they ate 95% of the time, they just ate elk. And they were so sick and tired of elk, some swore they had never eat a bite of elk again for the rest of their lives. Now, I believe some of the Indians dropped off some vegetables occasionally, but mostly breakfast, lunch, and dinner were all elk. And they just got tired of it. And so here they are grumbling about the present, the miraculous provision of God in the wilderness. Yuck! Manna! again. It despises the present. And then, of course, it ignores the future promises of God. What were they doing in the wilderness? They were being brought through the wilderness to enter into the land that God had promised to give them. Uh, when he delivered them out of Egypt, and then he set up the tent of the meeting or the tabernacle, and they went to the border of the promised land, and so murmuring kept them from entering the promised land. And that's because it ignores the future promises of God. They came back, Caleb and uh, the uh, Joshua came back, and they look at all this land flowing with milk and honey, just as God had promised. And uh, yes, there's giants in the land. Whoa! So... You ignore the future promises of God that you will conquer the enemy and enjoy the, the uh, abundance of the milk and honey and all the provisions of the land. And you ignore those promises and you latch on to the enemy, which is your anxiety and fear of not being in control. And so there you have the composite of murmuring and why it is so deadly. Reinterprets the past it despises the present, and it ignores the future promises of God. You should challenge yourself, as I, in the daily life that we live, because murmuring is a pervasive cancer in the soul. And we all fight it. And that's why our design confession is we desire, yet we push back. And some of our pushing back is this murmuring. What did Adam say regarding his present situation? It's this woman that you gave me. You know, my concrete present moment, it's the woman you gave me. Ignoring God's call to dominion and his promises and all the like, despising the current moment, and reinterpreting the past. Oh, Adam, what about your passivity as you sat and listened to the challenge? Why didn't you intervene, Adam, and take dominion, which I called you to in the garden? No, it's Eve. So there's the deadliness of murmuring, and I thought he did so well with it, I wanted to read it. Join with me in a short prayer. Lord, I pray that you will be in our speaking and in our hearing and in our heart's meditation. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. All right. Now, if you're asked are you a Christian? If you are, you'll say yes when someone asks you. But how do you know that you are a Christian? Are there proper marks and displays of being a Christian. And I would like to start out with the conclusion that this is a difficult question to answer because it is fraught with my most common word I've used from the pulpit since I've been here. It's fraught 
with tension. The Christian life is a hidden life. It is hidden in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. You see, when you become a Christian, the original sin, the swirl that causes our murmuring, is not taken away from you. The penalty, the judicial penalty of original sin, as well as all the actual sins that you committed up to the moment of becoming a believer, and all of the actions that will follow, that penalty for sin is gone. But original sin, which theologians call concupiscence, that's the inner swirl that causes our murmuring, that causes our actions of adultery, that causes our thoughts of adultery, that causes greed, that causes our thoughts of greed and having and possessing. You see, that's not taken away from you. And so there's a sense in which your life is hidden experientially in Christ as well. So it's hidden because you're in him. That is, he is your representative. And what he has done, you have done because you're in him. Now, in him is your final resting place in which not only is there no original sin, there's no stirring concupiscence, there's no actual sin. And you are finally the person whom God has created you to be, absent of all sin. Now, brothers and sisters in Christ, I really can't fathom that. Because the hiddenness of original sin, as it swirls and pulsates in my breast, is forever just on the edge, and I see it, and it's keenly, I'm keenly aware of it. And I think all believers should be as well. Now, there is a real moment of transition in which God regenerates the sinner. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's not a substance that God shoots into your veins. It's not grace in that material sense of the term. Rather, it's a new indwelling of a presence of God himself, creating new desires. Okay, so my original question is, how do you know you're a believer these marks of a believer should be in your life in some degree or another. And it's hidden because the swirl of original sin and concupiscence is side by side. But here we are. Look at the call to praise that Lane led us through. Psalm 63 on page 2 of your bulletin. Here's some marks of a believer. Verse 1, O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. There's an earnestness in your seeking of God. Now, we desire with earnestness, yet we push back. Sometimes God is the most uninteresting thing in my life. You see, this is how the Christian life is hidden so to speak. My soul thirsts for you. There should be a thirsting for God's very present. My flesh faints for you. Verse 2, so as a result of that, being in a dry land where there is no water, I looked upon you in the sanctuary. Now we saw this for the last two weeks. Behold your God. Look at him. Behold him. That's what the psalmist did. As a result of this hiddenness of thirsting and fainting and seeking and yet I've looked upon you in the sanctuary beholding your power and glory. 
You see, God is all glorious and he's powerful. We are not like him. This power and glory resides in him by virtue of his own being. And there are times when I despise him and hate him. Because sometimes his power and glory are displayed in ways that I cannot fathom. When Abraham took Isaac up the mountain in obedience to God, Isaac asked him, he said, I see the wood for the fire. Where is the sacrifice? Where is the lamb for the fire, for the sacrifice? Abraham couldn't speak. You know why he couldn't speak? Because the father is about ready to place his boy as the lamb in sacrifice to God. Who is this God that would ask us to sacrifice our own children? Who is he? You see, that God is powerful. That God is glorious. That he can actually ask that. You see now... The theodicy is a manner in which we defend God. Now quickly, those who defend God, they're called apologists of the Christian faith. Many of them say, aha, but we know the story, don't we? Isaac wasn't sacrificed. There was a lamb caught in the thicket. Yes, but God asked him to. So you're either stuck with God asking him to do something that's intrinsically evil and that impugns upon the goodness of God. Any other person that asks for a human life to be sacrificed is an evil, evil person. Yet God did. And yes, I know that he did not let it happen, but he asked. He is powerful and he is glorious in that respect. I'm not like him. I can't fathom that. I can't relate to it. I can't even accept it. I'm stopped dead in my tracks. But he's God. And I'm not. And if you contemplate this power and glory, you won't ever leave your house. As a matter of fact, you'll hide yourself in your house filled with anxiety like Howard Hughes. Because he's so powerful and great, he can come and get you in your house. Oh, Howard Hughes, you might try to rid yourself of every germ. You might have a lockdown in your own house in one room, but he can get you. I'm helpless before him. But you see, that doesn't bother me because I'm not him. And I'm not asked to get into his head. I'm not asked to mimic that part of God's request. And matter of fact, God tells me that that is so sinful that he destroys his own people and vomits them out of the land because in part they sacrificed their children to Moloch when they were involved in idolatry. I can't put it together in a nice little puzzle, but those are the truths that I see that are present in the text. And that has to do with his power and his dignity. His power and his glory. And then it says this. Because of your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. You see now, this is a mark of a Christian. You have the God who is not you, who is frightening at times, who has a moral authority that exceeds your imagination. But then this comes in verse 2. 3. Because your steadfast love is better than life. See, now that's something that's very tasty. It's spiritual. It's not shrimp. It's not crab. It's not filet mignon. But it's tasty. It's succulent. It's attractive. The hymn we sang last week, uh, your beauty, O God, 
Let me see your beauty. Here it is. His steadfast love is better than life itself, and that's why I fear nothing. There might be some ISIS person that could come in here and kill me dead in a moment, but I, I don't fear that. I don't fear the loss of my life. I'm not going to be tempting of the Lord, but I don't fear death. Now, that's a causal thing. Verse 3, because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. Aren't we supposed to praise God even if he's not? Uh, uh, Even if I don't get anything? Isn't that a pure heart? I'm going to worship God no matter what. No, that's Allah, that's Islam's God. That's not the Christian God. God is inherently beautiful. God is inherently good. God is so good that his goodness just moves me and my lips to praise him. And so now we've kind of gone through this a little bit. Do we thirst? Is our flesh fainting for his presence as we live in a dry, weary land where there's no water, no real water? So then we behold God in his sanctuary and we get a glimpse of his glory and his majesty and there's a certain fear that overcomes us. Yet, because of his steadfast love is better than life, my lips are going to praise him because he's inherently beautiful and attractive. And what is the beauty? It's his goodness. God's goodness is what is so inherently attractive about God. And that's why my lips praise him. But you have to see his glory. You have to taste his beauty in order to have lips that even want to praise him. Some people have No desire for God. Another mystery of God's hiddenness. God moves in mysterious ways. This God that I just described to you is the God of everyone in Torrington. And some are still sleeping. They have no interest in God. At least not the God of Scripture. Verse 5, my soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. Oh, I eat some dishes that I really like. They have cream, they have butter, they have sauteed this and that, and after I eat it, I know that I have ingested something really rich. I'm not quite sure if it's all good for me, but man, did I like it. Your soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. And my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. You see there? Everything's connected. Your soul's satisfaction, his steadfast love, causes you to praise him, to seek him with joyful lips. Here's what else it does in verse 6. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate upon you in the watches of the night. Someone said regarding insomnia, do you count sheep? Someone said, no, I talk to the shepherd. Yeah, if God has you up in the middle of the night, talk to him. Counting sheep is real boring. I I just can't, I, I can't do it. So, I remember upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. Now, I think good behavior and sound sleep is good and we should strive for it. But don't be fearful if God wakes you up. Talk to him. Verse 8, my soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. You see, you see the action of the believer clinging Upholding, thirsting, satiated. This is what it means to be a believer. And then look at verse 11. But the king shall rejoice in God, all who swear by him shall exalt. For, causal, because the mouths of liars will be stopped. 
You see, this is why we praise God. We know the end. We know the end of where history is going. And eventually, all evil and mouths of liars are stopped, and they are judged. I mean, this was what led Kant, who was a liberal Lutheran, to exclaim, of course there has to be uh, a reward in heaven and there has to be eternal life. How else can anyone function in a world where justice is not visible? Very much. And this is the Christian. Justice delayed is not justice denied. Justice delayed is not justice denied. And the king rejoices and exalts in this God precisely because of his judgment. Now liberal Christianity wants nothing to do with judgment. They tried to tweak the hymn of uh, Getty uh, who wrote this hymn on God's wrath is satisfied and they loved the hymn, they loved the melody, they wrote it, both the music and the words and in honor they called them and said can we change the words, we want it in our hymn book and they faithfully responded no. If you don't think there's a God of judgment you are not seeing clearly. Okay. So now that sets the stage to the danger of our murmuring. What does it do? It reinvents, reinterprets the past. It despises the present. And it ignores the future promises of God. Grumbling. First Corinthians 10. Pat read that to us, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 13. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers. Now this phrase either indicates a new thought in Paul, uh, and uh, in most cases that's what it does. He uses this phrase a lot. I don't want you to be ignorant, brothers and sisters. So now he's about ready to land somewhere here. Our fathers were all under the cloud. So now he's, Paul is reaching back into the old covenant. Prior to the arrival of, uh, pri prior to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And he begins to speak of the events of the past long ago. Our fathers were all under the cloud, all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Verse 3, all ate from the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Now, if you go back into the text, you're not going to find Christ in the text. But you see, this is Jesus as he talked to the two men on the road to Emmaus. And he says, don't you know that the entire Old Testament scriptures speak of me? And so that gives us the, not just the freedom, but the responsibility to see where Christ is in the Old Covenant. Not so we can throw it away, because the Old Covenant helps us see that which is in the New. But Moses is mentioned in verse 2, and Hebrews says that Jesus Christ is the mediator of a better covenant. So with Jesus Christ came a better mediator and a better covenant, because the old mediator, Moses, was, had a covenant that was insufficient. And what did that old covenant do? Its primary responsibility was to open up the eyes of suppressed sinners and let them know how evil evil is. That's the journey of the Old Covenant. The underlayment of that is the eternal grace of God that was coming and was shadowed throughout the Old Covenant and then it comes to, for, to bear in the coming of Jesus the Christ. Now I want you to take a look at verse 6. Now these things took place as examples for us. Okay? 
So we don't want to throw away the Old Testament. We don't want to ignore it. Just because it's an old mediator and an old covenant, we need to look at it because they're examples for us. Now, this word example for us is a translation of what I call dynamic equivalence. The word here is that Christ is a type for us. Uh, these events took place as a type for us. They were typological. Now that word type comes from a pound. And then it's the imprint that's left from the pounding that is really, we get at a very deep meaning of the word typological. And so these experiences hit history like this, leaving an imprint for us to learn from and see. Now the cloud and the baptism phrase into Moses is a foreshadowing of the baptism that we have in Christ. If you are a Christian, you will have been baptized. If you don't know about the baptism, then come and speak to me. It's not some sort of adornment on your Christian life. It is part and partial to your confession. So is the Lord's Supper, a frequent returning back to this that our Lord has left us. Baptism as an entrance, the Lord's Supper as a continuance, but make no mistake about it, Protestants have a, I think, a deeper and richer view of baptism, at least those who hold this view, than does our Roman Catholic counterpart of brothers and sisters there. And why is that? Because in Rome, the baptism erases original sin and I think takes away original sin and takes away the guilt of all actual sins up until the moment of baptism. And then there's in Roman Catholic theology, they call it the second plank. And that's penance. So your baptism takes you up to being a Christian, and then penance takes you up to jumping off into the cliff of purgatory to spend a little time of getting your head straight and your soul in order. Not so the Protestant view. The baptism doesn't take away the presence of original sin. That's where there's a little hiding here in your life. That's why Protestants at least have the theology of transparency and self-awareness. And all the bickering, all the murmuring doesn't have to take place now because I don't need to go around playing little psychological games in my head. I certainly don't need to be blaming my spouse for all the conflict and problems in the family and in, my, in, my, in our lives. Why? Because baptism not only takes the original sin, the guilt of original sin, up to the time of baptism, but because baptism places me in Christ, my future and my eternal security are in Christ. And so baptism is an initiating event which draws us into the future and the final destination of our Christian existence, which is heaven. It's heaven. That's what baptism does. Now, regarding the primary purpose of the law, I want you to look at the second to the last page in your bulletin uh, under rebellious generation in the wilderness. And you'll easily spot it because the other one says no scribbles and doodles, which is... Maybe where you've been all this time, I don't know, but that's okay, just turn the page. Religious generation, rebellious generation in the wilderness. So here is a layout 
by a theologian uh, whom I failed to put his name in there. And uh, uh, this really gives us a broad sweep of the book of Numbers. There are three cycles of the first phase of the rebellious generation in the wilderness. Now, what is the rebellious generation in the wilderness? That's the generation that left Egypt, and God took them to the border of the promised land, and they said, I don't think so, there's giants in the land. And so God took that generation on a 40-year detour until they all died. That's what the number Roman numeral one is, it's that generation in the wilderness from chapter 10, verse 11, all the way through chapter 25 of Numbers, verse 18. Now, there's three cycles here. He calls them cycles, and I think he's so spot on here. What is a cycle? That's something that just keeps on going, keeps on cycling. Cycle A, the decline and fall of first generation, chapters 10 through 15. Cycle B, Korah and company challenging Moses' authority, chapter 16 through 19. Cycle C, the rebellion and replacement of Moses, chapter 20 through 25. And if that were not enough, drop down to cycle A, where disobedience is even emphasized within the big cycles. Within cycle A, there are four movements of disobedience. Murmuring, chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. Complaining of the food, verses 4 through 35. The challenge of authority in chapter 12, 1 through 16. And here it is, the rejection of the promised land, chapter 13 ver- uh, through chapter 14 through 45. You see, typological, the experience. <laughs> that was funny. The experience of Israel foreshadowing our lives in Christ. God took them up to the very border and promise land that he promised to give them. But they're reinterpreting the past, reinventing the past, they're despising of the present, and their ignoring of God's future promises led them to say no. They are a type of unbelief that Scripture threatens us with if we disobey. They were all destroyed in the 40-year wandering. They were dead. They failed to enter the promised land. Now this is the keeping and the Uh, following and the claiming that we read about in Psalm 63. The marks of a Christian. We must persevere. Scripture calls us to persevere. And in our baptism, Christ calls us in our baptism because since we're in him, the power and the positioning of ourselves in him draws us into our future. It's called the perseverance of the saints. God will complete his work in you. Glory be to God. The glory, mysterious and majestic God whom we serve. So, So there's four cycles within just cycle A of what the law drives home in the Old Covenant. We are sinful. The first mediator could not empower God's people to do that which they were called to do. Now, the Roman numeral two, the second generation, we see now an A and B. There's the preparation of the new generation, chapter 26 of Numbers through chapter 30, verse 16, and the preparation for war, chapter 31 through chapter 36. Now, if we don't understand that this typological representation has significantly changed, not only do we have a new mediator, not only are we empowered, but the whole mechanism of the covenant has been changed. Paul will put it this way. We fight 
Oh yes, we fight. It is holy war, but not with swords and weapons of this world. We fight with the spirit and the sword of God's word. And so if you don't get that, you can create a theocracy. You can create a nation with special status and think you're going to overtake the world. That's what Constantine thought. He had this special kind of experience and he put the Christian mark on his shield as he conquered the world for Christ. Why? Because that icon was empowering them to defeat the enemy which was visible with swords. And Constantine got it all wrong and gave us Christendom with all its blessings but a fundamental curse it isn't of this world in terms of the warfare there is no sword for Christ not even a sphere which takes the name of Christ which does battle on behalf of the kingdom that is when Christ returns he will bring an end to it all under his authority by his word and these swords and the United Nations and all the other organizations of man's Tower of Babel will crumble in an instant by his word. Now, take the insert uh, that you have, I hope. It's called the chiastic structure of Israel's unfaithfulness. And I want to quickly go through this. Uh, if for those of you who are not familiar with the chiastic language that we've been teaching here for years, uh, you see there's an A on the left-hand side under passage and an A on the bottom. And these match as they proceed in the center. There's different chiasms. This is a center buildup of emphasis. And so the uh, maroon letter D as in dog is where this chiasm is going. You have misfortune on the top and bottom. You have food on the top, slightly different with water next in B. You have the leadership of Moses in C and the leadership of Moses and Aaron in C, a slight tweaking. All leading where? All leading to the promised land. Because the promised land is typologically heaven. That's where we're going. That's where we are called to go. And it's a journey of faith. And the weapon is in the spiritual realm. Not in this realm. Now as Christians we're called to serve our neighbor. And love our neighbor. And be a good Samaritan to our neighbor. And so politics can help alleviate the common curses of this world. And we should engage them to serve and to love our neighbor through a process that we have called a democracy. But it's not the kingdom. It's not the extension of the kingdom. Because the promised land typological reality is heaven. And we have a foretaste of heaven through baptism, which placed us in Christ, which then God regenerated us by his spirit, and we now taste of his goodness. We taste of his beauty, and we are being drawn to the promised land. Just like Israel was being led by the cloud into the, uh, through the wilderness, which is what the world is, to the borders of a geographic boundary upon which crossing it they entered the promised land. All of that is typological. Your faith journey through the struggle of perseverance and the fighting of the spiritual realm and yes, you can pray for governments and spiritual leaders because there's a spirit world behind that. They may think they're orchestrating this thing NATO may think they're orchestrating it. The United Nations may think they're really doing something. And Putin probably thinks he's doing something as well as Ukraine. And they are, but God is using them to accomplish all his purposes. In the final analysis, it's all God's doing. Now we are being led to the promised land. There was a delay of 40 years if you look at Yahweh's actions. So you got Moses' actions, you got what people complained about, you got Moses' actions, and you have Yahweh's actions. Now we don't have time, but we can 
do the same thing and replace Moses with Christ because Moses is a type and a figure of Christ, though he lacks the full reality of Christ because in both B, he lacks faith, and then in the bottom B, he and Aaron lack faith. But Christ never lacked faith. He's a better mediator with a better covenant. And the better covenant is that Christ now has brought the Spirit and the kingdom to this world. And he's given it to you if you're a Christian because he's regenerated you and has filled you with these new desires. And he's given you a new taste of the fat and the utter pleasure of seeing God as he is in Christ. The 40 years wandering has been shortened in the new covenant with the new mediator to how many days in Lent? Is it Lent? Throughout these 40 days? You see, it's typological. The second Mediator, the second Adam, has come and the 40 years has been turned into 40 days and Christ comes unwaveringly as our mediator and as our representative and he fails not. So this is where your faith needs to go now. It's to the new mediator who's done the new work who has guaranteed the outcome, and he's giving you foretastes of it by his Spirit in word and sacrament and in his very inhabiting you. Because what are you? You are the temple of God's very presence. I pray that you will learn how to fight this faith and how to be drawn into the future which God has prepared for us by virtue of his son's work and he has given us a taste of it by his spirit. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. I think I have dropped it somewhere. I heard it fall. There it is. Let's stand now and confess the Nicene Creed in the front of your song book. Uh, Thank you.
see, you see there's a Trinitarian confession. We believe in one God. Next paragraph, we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ. And the final one, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life. But you see, God is coming at us from all different kinds of directions. Word and sacrament. The presence of his spirit. And we mustn't get caught up in the chronological layout of the land as though somehow this is essential for salvation. Just accept that God comes to you in water, that God comes to you in bread and in wine and the fruit of the vine, and he comes to you in word, and, and he comes to you by virtue of his spirit being in you. And all of this coalesces into this life in Christ. And each has its distinctive mark. And each is a mode of encouragement for all who belong to Jesus. Its most beautiful mark is the ability to call God our Father and to speak to him. And so now we come to a point in time where we open things up for prayer. Anything that God has laid on your heart, please uh, lift up your voice so we can all hear and be assured that God hears the silent cries as well as those vocalized. And then when there's silence, I will ask you to join with me in praying the Lord's Prayer together. So let's come to God in prayer. Lord, hear the prayers of your people. Lord, I just pray for Kurt and Darlene, that you bring peace to them, and you bring peace to Darlene, and bring comfort to Kurt in the in that, that you are in control of all things, and I just pray that you can give him the strength and the stamina to, to just keep moving forward, and uh, I, I pray that they can just feel your, your presence in all of this. Lord, I thank you, as I do over and over, for the faithful congregation that has continued to support a faithful church where the word of God is, is taught rightly and preached rightly, sacraments are administered rightly, and there's scriptural discipline if it's needed. And I thank you for it not yet being needed. Thank you for that, Lord. I pray that you continue to bless this congregation with faithfulness, bless the session and for the deacons with faithfulness, Pastor, to continue to be faithful and preach your word rightly, minister your sacraments rightly. Lord, I pray for a revival in this church, in this town, in this county, in this state, in this nation. Indeed, in the world, Lord. Um, there is so much that's out there that's against your standards, Lord, your simple standards of, of your creation ordinances. That there are men and there are women. There is marriage between a man and a woman. Lord, the world has moved beyond that in a wicked, wicked way. And I just perceive that the wickedness all about us will continue. And unless you see fit, Lord, to send the revival, send your spirit so that we may enter into a period of reformation, keep this church faithful. Continue to bring whom you will to worship with us. I thank you for that. In Jesus' name. Lord God, I pray for all of our covenant children who are not close to you. I pray that you will really work in, in them through the power of the Holy Spirit, especially upon reminder of their baptism and that you will bring them all close to you in true saving faith. And now, if you would, please join with me in praying the Lord's Prayer found in your bulletin on page 3.
Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lamb of God. Type. It's the strike, but not really the strike, it's the imprint after the strike. Type and typological are not theological jargon that I try to pour out on you because I have a degree. It's found in Scripture. You are to study the Scripture. It's in there, literally. When Thomas says, I will not believe in you until I see the mark in his hands, the type left from the nail on his hands. This is the fruit of Christ's work in which he calls us and invites us in all helplessness and in all hiddenness to come and taste and see that he is good. On the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, take and eat, this is my body given for you. In the same way, he took the cup of blessing and when he had given thanks, he poured the fruit of the vine, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant, my blood shed for you for the remission of sins. This drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. And when you're ready, as our text and Psalms indicated, come. Jesus' favorite word, come. The body of Christ shed for you. The body of Christ shed for you. The body of Christ for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. 
The blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. The blood of Christ shed for you. 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 Thank you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The body of Christ given for you. And the body and blood of Christ given for you. Let's stand and sing forth our exiting hymn, number 66. As you have been brought here, you are now being sent out. God's blessing, our true faith confessing. Christ and his church. Deeply mysterious. God didn't create Adam and then change to plan B. Adam was a type. And a type is the mark left and a foreshadowing of what is to come. Paul in Romans 5 puts it this way. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. 
For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one to come. The type has come. God's real plan has been revealed in space and time in history. And we killed him. The Jews, proximately, in Rome, proximately. But you and I killed him. Because of our sin. That's why he came. To take that fiery baptism upon himself. Which is your sin and mine. And he did away with it. The penalty is gone. So go in the second Adam, in the new covenant, with the new and glorious mediator, Jesus the Christ. Thank you for coming, and God bless you.